Okay, great. Um, just a brief uh, land acknowledgement. The archaeological research facility, of course, uh, sits on the uh, ancestral and unceded land the, of Huchin, the territory of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people, successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. So without further ado, I am happy to be able to introduce today Trent Trombley, who was a Fulbright doctoral scholar um, in our program, and he's completing his doctoral degree in the Department of Anthropology here. Uh, beginning in August 2023, uh, Trent will be an assistant professor of anthropology at Augustana University. For those of you that don't know, uh, Trent's research focus is on bioarchaeological approaches to funerary taphonomy, paleohistology, skeletal and dental health, with a focus on the medieval period of Italy and Portugal. He has uh, been a busy beaver and he's got numerous publications in the uh, American Journal of Biological Anthropology, Journal of Medieval Archaeology, and Bioarchaeology International. Um, some of you probably might not remember that Trent was a junior transfer student as an undergraduate with us. So he's been with us a long time. He's been an integral uh, member of the archaeology and bioarchaeology cohort. Uh, he's been a great teacher for us in our department. So this is very bittersweet for us. Um, we actually don't want him to go. It's kind of the linchpin in the skeletal biology lab. So linchpin is when, when he leaves, we will blow up without you. <laughs> Um, so we're very proud of, of Trent. Um, we've learned a lot from over the years. We're excited to hear about your dissertation work today. And the title of his talk is Crossing the Divide, a Bioarchaeological Approach to Religious Lifeways and Deathways in Medieval Santorum, Portugal. All right. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Professor Agarwal, and it too is bittersweet for me as well. And I'll try to make sure that I uh, convey some of that in the acknowledgements here at the end. Uh, I want to do a quick disclaimer before we start this presentation that this presentation will contain images of human remains, specifically human skeletal remains. Uh, my dissertation research focuses on bioarchaeology and skeletal dental remains. Uh, I don't use these images lightly. I use them with the explicit consent and permissions of, the, of my collaborators within central Portugal. And all the images you'll see here today are specifically from medieval contexts within Portugal. The general arc of this presentation uh, is going to follow five major themes. We'll start by defining bioarchaeology before maneuvering into medieval Iberian history in the funerary context. We'll then look to operationalize a bioarchaeology of both lifeways and deathways before moving into the methodology and results, and then finally conclude with interpretations and some ethno-historical considerations. Let's start by defining bioarchaeology. Bioarchaeology Broadly, is the study of human skeletal remains from historic and archaeological contexts uh, in order to reconstruct lived, and as I will try to argue here today, death experiences for the communities in the past. And this stems from the idea that what we do, what we eat, how we move, becomes embodied and recorded in our bones and teeth, many times without us even knowing it. Bones are organs, and therefore they are alive, plastic, and dynamic. This is a big departure from a lot of popular conceptions of bones and teeth as being somehow static or inert. And as a result, bioarchaeology then is more than just skeletal anatomy. We're not just interested in bones themselves, but focusing on the interaction between bones, teeth, biology, and behavior, or biology and culture. And as a result, bioarchaeologists are often champions of a biocultural approach, which seeks to blur the boundaries or natural separation we often have in popular culture between biology and culture or nature and nurture. This stems from the idea that our skeletons are shaped across our life through their response to both internal and external stimuli. Internal stimuli, such as maintaining homeostasis, skeletons are an amazing source of things like minerals and calcium and phosphate, but also external stimuli, that is the physical activities we do, the foods we eat, all become embodied, in, embodied and recorded in the, in the physical and chemical matrices of our bones and teeth, which then transform our experiences in our bodies. So bioarchaeologists are really at the, at the front of trying to champion this biocultural approach, uh, but I think while bioarchaeologists have done well to blur these boundaries, uh, I would argue that we failed to similarly integrate life and death into our theoretical toolkit. Bioarchaeologists are generally more concerned with reconstructing aspects of lifeways or livelihood as recorded in bones and teeth and not death, dying, and funerary processes. And I think this is best seen in a quote by John Robb, who states, quote, we have not had an archaeology of dying or even an archaeology of death. What we've had is an archaeology of already dead persons, end quote. And this is certainly something that rings true for those of us who work on human skeletal remains. And so I think the, the framework in term uh, uh, by Michael Parker Pearson in the late 90s of Deathways is really useful here. 
He termed this as the pluralistic process and negotiation that accompanies death and dying, as a sort of foil to livelihood or lifeways. And this is a stems from a recognition that death is a social act. And as we'll see today, in, in case of the Middle Ages, a daily aspect of medieval life. I think this helps to tackle the tendency to treat the living as vibrant and the dead as somehow inert. And what we see is many cultures today, and especially in the medieval period, death and life were not always so neatly separated. And the way I'll try to do this today is through uh, the framework of funerary toponymy. Toponymy was originally coined by a, a Soviet paleontologist Ivan Efremov as, quote, the study of the transition from the biosphere to the lithosphere, end quote. This is somewhat jargony, but essentially what Ivan Akramov was trying to get at is that how do things go from being in the realm of the living to become paleontological specimens or fossils? Mm -hmm. Taphos meaning burial, nomos meaning laws of. So effectively the study of the laws of burial. And he did this by trying to articulate a triad or three different temporal processes, starting with necrology or the study of the death event of the organism. This is followed by biostratinomy, which comes out of geology as the post-death but pre-depositional or pre-burial processes. That is the interval between the organism's death and before it becomes buried. Finally, diagenesis looks at the post-depositional or post-burial processes. In other words, the interval between when the organism was buried and when it was discovered by paleontologists, or as we'll see, by archeologists. This becomes a pretty interesting theoretical adoption for archaeologists in the 20th century because it was reminiscent of a lot of the problems that archaeologists were also encountering. And so archaeologists in the 20th century expand taphonomy to non-biological organisms, ceramics, etc. And in that light, we see a tendency to separate cultural from natural taphonomic agents, or C and N transforms. And we'll talk about this a little bit more detail in a second. And so then taphonomy by archaeologists is typically seen as distortion or bias, a reduction of what was originally there. Uh, the subject of interest for many archaeologists is, in fact, humans and human behavior in the past. As such, archaeologists have tended to define taphonomy as the non-cultural or natural factors that affect preservation. In archaeology, then, taphonomy is typically framed in a distortive manner as the cumulative processes that winnow away our abilities to get at the lived communities of the past. The idea being that you could figure out what natural processes occurred between deposition or burial and excavation, which could then be stripped away almost like layers of an onion to get at the core cultural depositional history. And we can see this diagram here of for paleontologists on the left and archaeologists on the right. We have a biological community that's somehow a whole circle, but successive processes such as death, decomposition, burial are going to winnow the overall sample collected by paleontologists. And archaeologists have used a similar sort of framework to understand these different assemblages. But this gets into a sort of interesting philosophical realm between paleontological organizations of taphonomy and archaeological ones. And I think we can consider something like rodent gnaw marks, such as observed uh, in this bison bone here, these sorts of marks here from a rodent. Uh, they've certainly removed material of the bone and alternate, but how should we conceptualize it? Should we see these as a reduction of information or an addition of information? While archaeologists and bioarchaeologists frequently conceive of taphonomic agents such as these gnaw marks as reductive, Traditional taphonomists typically see these actually as additive. After all, while sample has been lost, we've learned a lot about the presence of rodents, their tooth dimensions, the exposure on the surface, and their exposure of remains to different scavengers. I think to paraphrase a really good friend and actual previous graduate of this department, uh, one scholar's noise is probably another scholar's signal that they're interested in. And so this really reaches its zenith for us in, in archaeology with the Pompeii premise. Uh, and we see this articulated through two major scholarly debates in a series of publication between two principal scholars, Michael Schiffer and Lewis Binford. Michael Schiffer argued generally that modifications by both natural or N transforms and non natural or C transforms uh, ultimately distort the systematic context into what is observed as the archaeological context, somewhat reminiscent of that uh, previous winnowing we saw earlier. Whereas Lewis Binford uh, debated, no, distortions are the archaeological record, that everything else can only be likened to the sort of exceptional and rapid deposition of something like Pompeii, which had this very exemplary sort of preservation as a result of, um, of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius and ash layers. So to quote Lucas here uh, as a retrospective, looking on the Pompeii premise, quote, where Binford sees an irresolvable palimpsest, suggesting that the systematic context actually needs to be studied at a larger temporal scale, Schiffer sees the challenge as dissecting the palimpsest to understand the small scale events that produced it in the first place. And this begs a, a rather interesting questions, uh, especially for someone like me as a bioarchaeologist, how do we deal with this in terms of human remains? 
We have an, uh, an image here of the famous philosopher Diogenes, the Greek philosopher and one of the founders of cynicism, who requested that after his death, his body be cast over the walls of Athens with complete callous disregard. Uh, he purportedly mocked most of Greek society's concern for funerary treatment of the dead, positing why should anyone care what happens when they are dead? Of course, we know this is not what most humans do. Human remains, although certainly not more special um, than any non-human materials or remains, are often not casually discarded. They're typically intentionally disposed of and indeed buried in a deliberate, culturally informed manner. Of course, the basic uh, tenet of funerary archaeology is the dead do not bury themselves. And to counter our paleontological colleagues, humans do not solely occupy the biosphere, but more of a sort of biocultural sphere. And if, uh, if they didn't, funerary archaeologists, I think, would be out of a job. So what I would argue here today is that results at Larga Candida dos Reis in central Portugal suggest that taphonomy, at least in these human skeletal remains, is likely best understood stood in eschatological terms. Eschatology here I'm defining is the concern by medieval communities for how the body was prepared for the end times, resurrection, and intercession of the soul in the afterlife. That is to say, medieval cultural, religious, and ontological conceptions of death, funerary preparation, and burial are inextricably linked with funerary taphonomic consequences. So this helps set up some of the larger research onto the actual context of medieval Iberian history. We're going to be looking here at the site of Larga Candida dos Reis, uh, about 80 kilometers northeast of the country's capital, Lisbon. And this site was excavated in 2004 and 2005 by my esteemed collaborators and colleagues who work directly with the municipalities. That, that is, they are municipally sponsored archaeologists who do a lot of the work here in response to urban development and the constant urbanization and subsurface uh, surveys or destruction that might otherwise be incurred. So in the upper left-hand photo here, we see a backhoe digging a trench. As a result of putting in new pipelines and renovating this area into a roundabout to alleviate traffic, alleviate traffic congestion, they ended up finding a large cemetery complex with north of 600 burials. These burials were excavated because they would have otherwise been destroyed by the subsequent construction. But as we can see, this excavation went on for well over a year and was done in a very public facing manner. There's a lot of pedestrian activity and foot activity. And as a result, we even see some of my collaborators here interacting with local um, passerbys as well as news agencies and the Islamic community of Lisbon who came and did a documentary. And I'm happy to speak more about that. I'm going to try uh, ambitiously to condense about 2,000 years of history into one slide. So, uh, so let's try our best. So we're going to start with a very brief religious political timeline of medieval Centenine. We'll start with the Roman period, which occurs in the roughly 2nd century BCE when Romans take control of the city or establishment of Centenine and establish it as the city of Scalabus. They're able to maintain control until around the mid 5th century when Visigothic conquerors end up uh, converting the city into a Visigothic uh, domain. We don't know a lot about the Visigothic period today due to a lack of materials and documents, but it's certainly, uh, at least in central Portugal, but it's certainly an area of uh, interesting future inquiry. They're able to maintain control until early 8th century when Muslim forces arrived from North Africa. Now, whether this was done through full-blown battle or more through peace treaty negotiation is very, very heavily debated. Uh, and so while the jury's still out, I think, on, on how the city was uh, converted into an Islamic cultural domain, I think it's safe to say that it certainly became an important religious, political, uh, and trade and militaristic center for the, uh, for the caliphate in the 8th century and maintains under Islamic control until the mid-12th century. It's not until the mid-12th century where we see various factions within the Muslim community and a series of revolts uh, weaken the Almohad rulers of the city. This makes the city sort of ripe for the taking from Christian kings who are slowly starting to conquer southwards from the northern portions of Spain and Portugal. This is often articulated as part of the larger Reconquista. And I put the Reconquista here in quotes because I explicitly reject this term in accordance with many other scholars who see it as a 20th century uh, invention from the political Catholic uh, fascist regimes. It was probably a lot more uh, piecemeal and palimpsest in terms of these conquests and not one unified event in the name of Christianity. So we see this sort of fantastical depiction that I've chosen for the, for the banner image here of the Christian king, specifically Don Alfonso Enrique, who would become the first king in Portugal, with various crusader forces taking over the city in a sort of epic manner, which is probably quite fantasized. Uh, it becomes a really important Christian pilgrimage and religious center throughout the later Christian Middle Ages. And we see in the late 15th century, of course, with Ferdinand and Isabella, the, the formal expulsion of religious minorities from the Iberian Peninsula in the late, uh, late 15th century. 
So this tends to paint things in very antagonistic terms. And I would, I would also want to caution that much of the conflict between faith communities was probably more politically and geographically motivated than religious. And we even see some various depiction here of various religious communities um, playing various board games with one another, likely speaking to some of the conviviality and some of the uh, intercultural, multicultural nature of the Iberian Peninsula during the Middle Ages. But undoubtedly, there's immutable evidence uh, in the case of burials within the city of Santarém and many other parts of Iberia that really uh, speak to the differences in religious ways of approaching death and dying. And so when we maintain our understanding of these shifting periods of religious political autonomy throughout the Iberian Middle Ages, we see two principal necropolis represented at the site of Larga Candida dos Reis. The majority of burials, 422 of them, are in the medieval Muslim tradition, whereas about 217 burials were in the more typical late medieval Christian tradition. These are uh, quite different in terms of the way the body and the tomb itself is prepared. Muslim burials in the Middle medieval period in many parts of the world today are buried on their right side uh, with the face oriented towards the southeast. If we think of this white arrow as pointing north, oriented towards the southeast facing Mecca. Uh, Christian burials a bit more variable in their orientation. Islamic graves are typically ritually washed, stripped of clothing and wrapped in a Yemeni cotton shroud or kafan. Whereas Christian burials could be more variably wrapped in shrouds, but also their clothing or some sort of funerary vestments. And we see evidence of things like belt buckles that probably attest to this, even though the textiles themselves do not uh, preserve. Christian burials also uh, tend to have a lot more commingling, that is additional individuals within the same tomb or, or grave. We see here a Christian individual buried on their back, which is very typical, arms crossed across the breast or lower abdomen flanked by two additional skulls on either side of the upper arm bones and an additional jumble of bones at the foot of the grave. This likely is something that starts to happen more and more in the later Christian Middle Ages as cemeteries become increasingly associated with churches and proximity to churches and the importance of consecrated ground. And so they end up reutilizing the same graves and tomb structure to take previous occupants out, put a new individual in and jumble the bones at the foot of the grave. So very distinct styles of funerary treatment here, but both with the long-term idea of preserving the body for resurrection. And so when we think about this in a larger ethno-historical context, we see that much of the Islamic tradition stems from the work of Malik Ibn Anas, a Sunni theologian who uh, was born at around the onset of the Islamic settlement of Iberia, which typically advocated for narrow graves in order to keep the body on its right side facing Mecca, as we'll see and try to problematize a bit, shallow graves, uh, potentially to hear the call to prayer continued in death, uh, and could be supplemented with funerary manuals and oral and scriptural interpretations as well. Whereas in terms of Christianity, at the most upper level, uh, we have ecumenical decrees and papal bulls coming directly from the papacy. Whether these actually uh, cascaded into what people practice in medieval Portugal, I'm a little more skeptical of, but they, they definitely advocate for a very particular style of treatment of the body. Most of these individuals are representative of the local Christian laity or parishioners who would have subscribed to this particular parish. And so they're often buried in these sort of uh, parish churchyards in the case of consecrated grounds. And as a result, follow local parish laws and customs. So painting with very broad strokes, I would say from the ethnic historical and in some of the material things we see throughout Iberia, Islamic graves tend to be highly prescribed, whereas Christian graves tend to be a lot more variable. So this helps set up some of the context onto operationalizing a bioarchaeology of both life ways and death ways. And so what's, to me, really interesting about the site is we have, and I'm going to borrow from my collaborator here, who, who was the, the lead excavator of the site and wrote the, a series of reports where he defines this as distinct cultures in the same space. And sometimes we quite literally have that. Here we have an Islamic burial that's later reduced or bisected by a Christian grave after the Christian conquest. So within the exact same grave sort of sequence, by happenstance, we have very different funerary treatments. And in fact, these Christian, uh, th those who constructed this Christian tomb seem to have actually kept the lower extremities of the Islamic as an individual and cached it with the Christian individual here, which is quite interesting. So this is an interesting opportunity then to examine how two distinct religious burial custom within the same geographical space shed light on both life ways and death ways. In other words, my research question predominantly for my dissertation was, what is the relationship between religious funerary treatment and skeletal indicators of lived experience and post-mortem bodily integrity? And we can do this in terms of a juxtaposition of lifeways and deathways. Lifeways seeks to illuminate aspects of people's livelihood in the past as recorded in their bones and teeth. And the methodology for this is a bioarchaeology of the life course. That is taking a detailed understanding of how different bones correspond to different portions of our, our embodied experience and sampling different skeletal regions to build a composite of lived experience for that individual. So just some examples here, uh, indicators of metabolic stress, such as defects in tooth enamel or the stature of an individual or height. 
diet, oral health, and hygiene, whether by looking at the teeth themselves or maybe the chemical matrices of bones and teeth that are uh, embodied, uh, as well as activity, things that, like how you use your muscles and how those might affect certain muscle markers, the actual amount and quality of cortical bone. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways we can go about reconstructing life ways through bioarchaeology. In terms of death ways, the objective is really to understand death, dying, and funerary treatment and what happens after death. And the methodology here would be funerary archaeology as well as funerary toponymy. And we can look at this by looking at the grave construction. Was it in the earth? Was it a tomb? What are the dimensions of those tombs? We can borrow from late 20th century French archaeological excavation techniques called archaeothanatology. This is an incredibly meticulous, detailed version of excavating human burials that tries to reconstruct each and every joint sequence between bones to understand how the body decomposed in a decompositional and anatomical manner. Uh, then we can look at macro and microscopic preservation. In other words, are the bones there? If not, why? Is there any sort of pattern to them not being there? Are they well-preserved? Are they fragmentary? Are they eroded in any sort of way? Uh, and the micro-preservation, do we have any sort of uh, penetration of the microstructure or loss of the protein content of bones? So there's a lot of ways on both life ways and death ways we can go about this. I've collected a lot of data on both sides of this, but I'm only going to be presenting a small subsection here in terms of life ways looking at metabolic stress, specifically via stature and iron deficiencies and malnutrition. And in terms of death ways, looking at the grave construction, uh, as well as some indicators of macro preservation. So let's get into some of the methodology and results. And we'll start with life ways here. And I'm gonna be starting uh, again with stature, as well as uh, two additional indicators, parotid hyperostosis and periosteal inflammation. Uh, we're able to measure various elements throughout the skeleton in order to reconstruct the stature or height of an individual, provided the bone is complete. Adult stature is a really complex product of genes, environment, and nutrition working together. But stature is particularly sensitive to environmental insults during growth and development, such that comparing stature across different groups with differing sources of uh, information can help uh, elucidate differential patterns of compromised growth. Other skeletal indicators here, termed parotid hyperostosis and periostitis here, can be seen in the skull and lower leg bones respectively and are marked by bony activity and a proliferation of this sort of porosity. Uh, the etiology of these conditions are highly variable, ranging from parasites, pathogen loads, iron deficiencies, and malnutrition. And so we tend to score these conservatively as part of a larger class or suite of indicators of physiological and metabolic disturbance. <laughs> In terms of some of the results here, I'm going to be showing a couple of graphs. On the left, we're going to have a, a, a comparison of the funerary groups. On the right, we'll do a comparison of sex. And this is going to be so far just for stature. So the way to read these is the x-axis is going to be corresponding to stature in centimeters. If you're shifted towards the right of the x-axis, you're going to have, a, on average, a taller stature. Okay? Now, these are uh, Bayesian posterior distributions. So what we want to see here is how this distribution maps for the Islamic group versus the Christian group. And we see the mode here is effectively the middle value. And so we can see that Islamic groups are, on average, greater than Christian stature on average, uh, which could be speaking to different genetics, but also nutritional access during the growth and development phase. In terms of males and females, we see uh, quite a stark difference. These distributions do not overlap whatsoever. Uh, and both Christian males and Islamic males are significantly taller than their female counterparts, which is typically something we attribute to sexual dimorphism, differences within the sexes. These can be highly variable, they're not universal, but at least in these samples, they seem to be quite stark, which we do tend to see in um, highly gendered sort of societies as we do in the Middle Ages, uh, with an average of 10 centimeters of difference. Uh, but curiously, Islamic females are significantly taller than their Christian female counterparts. So this again might be part of the story of genetics, but also nutrition during the growth and development period. And especially when we layer on the indicators, additional indicators of nonspecific stress, it starts to paint this picture a little more clearly. Christian skeletons exhibited a 182% increased risk of parotid hyperostosis and a 23% increased risk of periosteal infections relative to their Islamic counterparts. So I think altogether, the increase in stress associated with Christian skeletons and in stature may be part of this tumultuous arrival of the Christian conquest, which fundamentally altered a lot of the, uh, the landscape after the 12th century. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the discussion. As for the death ways, I'm gonna be going into a little bit more detail here. Uh, so we'll start with burial metrics. Uh, my collaborators uh, did a very meticulous job of excavating and following this sort of late 20th century French paradigm to where even after you've taken the body out of the grave, doing detailed drawings of the grave dimensions in various transects of every portions of the grave to see how bodies effectively decompose in space. And so on the left here, we have an Islamic burial example, and on the right, a Christian. And this is going to be as if you're looking down on the grave with the body taken out. And these are various transects that we can see to understand some of these funerary architectures. 
and as a result, we can actually take measurements of these. And this is what I'm going to be presenting on here. The burial length, in other words, how uh, head to toe length of a particular burial, doesn't seem to differ much between the Islamic and Christian groups. Here, the Islamic are portrayed uh, in these graphs in this sort of aqua, Christian in this gold color. And the y-axis is going to correspond to our, our metric of interest in centimeters. And what we see is that these distributions here are roughly equal with the small little data points here. Uh, but where we see major differences is in burial width and burial depth. That is, the, the Islamic ones are shifted down in terms of being more narrow and more shallow than their Christian counterparts on average. Uh, and in fact, in terms of width, it seems to be a much more narrow distribution or narrow sort of rectangle here. Again, maybe speaking to some of this highly prescribed nature of constructing the graves in a very narrow manner. Why? Uh, well, if we look at some of the extreme examples from photos, we can see this a little more clearly. We see an Islamic grave here is quite narrow and quite shallow in terms of its proximity to the surface. This Christian grave is a, a more deep example of a much deeper and wider tomb. And in fact, during the 12th century, uh, Ibn al-Dum was writing about this. The, the quote, the length and width of graves must be increased a little because I've seen that one corpse had to remove three times to the from the tomb to fix the hole and another corpse had to be forcefully squeezed into the grave. Begs the question, why keep them so narrow? And this is in part to keep the body oriented on its right side facing Mecca. If you make the burial too wide, even in this individual, you can see they've sort of decomposed and slumped against this wall. But if you make it much wider, the individual will fall almost completely dorsally or onto their back, and maybe only the skull remains. As a result, we actually see throughout many portions of the Iberian Peninsula and in Portugal and in this site, evidence of small sherds, bricks, or rocks placed underneath the head to keep it propped towards the right side, oriented towards Mecca. So that might explain some of the narrowness. What about the shallowness? And if we go back to our transects here, this up here towards this F would be sort of the, the surface and how deep it is, this white portion here, versus the Islamic. Again, these are two extreme ends of the distribution, but you can see just how shallow something like 402 as Islamic grave is compared to the Christian one here. And I think this is a, there's a mix of things going on here. There, there's a lot of ethno-historical uh, and archaeological evidence for intentionally making burials shallow in order to continue to hear the call to prayer, as well as funerary goers. That is, people who go to the cemetery to give some sort of prayer, being shallow enough to still hear them. But I think also landscaping, terraforming, and grading have also altered this landscape over the course of millennia. So it's probably something, a, a mixture of these two uh, in, in tandem. Transitioning to the bones themselves, one of the things we can look at is erosion. This is going to be a, an interaction of roots and local acids within soils that start to corrode the actual bone itself. So we usually score this on a, a scale of zero, meaning minor erosion or no erosion, to five plus major erosion. So something like this individual would have a score of one. There's some minor bits of etching here. This would be something more like a score of five, given the, the sort of crumply nature Here's something like five plus. The, the entire structure has effectively been corroded by root activity and acids. And this makes a tremendous deal of sense because roots are oftentimes secreting acids and, and navigating through the rhizosphere, but also looking for dense sources of nutrients for themselves. And burials can often be a really dense source of nutrients for, for a variety of organisms. And in many cases, I actually observed roots that were still in C2 that had tunneled right through bones. And so when we compare these by the funerary groups, we see on the x-axis here, erosion score. Again, the Islamic is going to be this aqua color. It's the whole distribution for the Islamic is shifted more towards the severe side of erosion, whereas the Christian bones are shifted towards the, the minor side of erosion. So more severe erosion Islamic graves, uh, again, maybe interaction with acidic soils, but closer proximity to the surface and root systems. And here's an example of an Islamic grave here. And if we look at this area here, we see some roots tunneling just above the grave itself. And in many cases, we see more heavy inundation. But it's not just roots, uh, and this is one of, I think, the most interesting things about this site is uh, not only the presence of various faith communities in the same sort of cemetery space, but the peculiar preservation of a lot of invertebrates, specifically snails. Uh, so if we look at this particular grave here and zoom in, we see a proliferation of snail shells situated in the pelvic cavity. Uh, and as I started working on more of these remains, part of the collaboration agreement early on was we can we can try to figure out something what's going on with lifeways, but we got to figure out what the heck these snails were doing in the burials. And these do not appear to be uh, intentionally placed here, uh, as of course uh, as opposed to more of a funerary treatment. And this starts to ring true when I started to look at the remains in more detail. I started finding snails in all sorts of peculiar paces embedded in the body. In this case, lodged between two teeth. This was from endocranial matrix. That's in, within the brain case. This is one lodged in sort of the ear canal that had gotten stuck. And this is one from uh, within a tunnel or void that it had made it accreted to the pelvic uh, cavity or matrix. Now, there seems to have been a lot of different sorts of shells and types. And I just want to commend my collaborators who under municipal 
time and financial constraints, went to the pains of collecting snails, despite none of us being archaeomalacologists. Uh, but this is something that we've been trying to slowly work at. So what I did for every complete shell that was recovered that I encountered was measure the height, lesser and greater width, and count the number of swirls or spirals. And take all this data and put it into a statistical form to see if we can try to elucidate species ID. And I'm happy to chat a little bit more about this at the QA. It's notoriously difficult to identify species on shell alone, but using as many indices as possible can help. This is a, a principal component analysis. I won't go too much into the detail here. What I'd like to, to show you is that when we put all these dimensions together, we see roughly seven different groups or clusters here. Uh, potentially corresponding to different species candidates. Now, I started collaborating with uh, uh, a gentleman at, and a professor of archaeomalacology and, and in snails at the University of Coimbra, who is a specialist in Portuguese snails, and we were able to get a preliminary seven different species uh, ID. And this is something that we're, we're really excited to try to follow up on, uh, because if they are indeed archaeological, they're probably going down and burrowing uh, as a result of decomposing or eating this decomposing material. And we have observed snails and slugs to be necrophagous, that is, they eat decomposing material because they're dense sources of calcium to help build their shells. And what's rather interesting is that we have some species, Rumina decolata here, which is a voracious predator that feeds on other snails that are feeding on decomposing material. So we have a really complex ecology going on here within these burial environments. And we're trying to see how we might be able to understand not only what the environment of the cemeteries were like in the medieval period, but also, again, their proximity. Uh, and so what I did here was try to do a comparison of these snail shells and see, is there any sort of difference by funerary group? And it turns out there's quite a few differences. Islamic graves are more than twice as likely to have snails than their Christian counterparts. Additionally, the density of snails in Islamic graves is much higher, 833 snails from what I analyzed versus only 181 in Christian contexts. And then what I tried to do here is look at the uh, various dimensions to see if we can get a rough distribution of overall size. That is, are bigger shells associated with any group? And it turns out they're associated with the Islamic group here. That is, this, this black line here and all these different data points seem to cluster higher in terms of being larger in the Islamic group context. So Islamic graves having a higher prevalence, density, and size of snail shells. I think this is really interesting in terms of bioturbation, that is, biological organisms that cause a sort of mixture in soil at a local level, but also proximity to the surface and where they're able to actually burrow down. Uh, these are air-breathing land snails. If they go too deep or they get covered, they often suffocate and will die. And that's probably part of the story of what's going on here. So now we're going to be looking at macroscopic preservation indices, uh, the bone representation index and preservation index. Instead of just looking at these sort of boring formulae, what I'd ask you to do is think of the top one as, is there bone at all? And the bottom one says, how much of the bone is there? In other words, if we come to a skeleton, we expect the average adult skeleton to have 206 bones. And we want to see how much of those bones are there to begin with. And then if so, how much of that bone is actually preserved? Is it poorly or, or uh, well-preserved? This all comes from our zooarchaeological colleagues. So if we take something like the, the humerus, the upper right arm bone, uh, we can draw an imaginary line through about halfway of that bone and say a bone is well-preserved if more than 50% of it is present blue check mark here, versus not well preserved if less than 50% of it is present. And we can aggregate these kinds of scores for every single bone in the skeleton and for every skeleton that we analyze at a site. And so we have a series of indices that we then classify. Well preserved bones are bones that have 50% of their elements present, like our blue check mark, whereas a well preserved skeleton is a skeleton having at least 50% of its bones well preserved, such as the blue check mark. We can do a similar level of uh, rationale for the representation of bones. And we use these different ones in concert because they tell different stories. And I think we can show that in the data here. So what we're going to see is a heat map that I've constructed. Uh, and these are based on adult primary burials. So uh, something that hasn't been disturbed too much. Um, 227 Islamic individuals and 136 Christian. And these are the aggregate values for each of those bones that I analyze. Darker blue in this case uh, corresponds to a, a better representation, more likely the bone is present. Darker red values, uh, less likely that the bone is represented. We don't see a ton of differences between the funerary groups at this level. Uh, we see, in fact, some similarities. The, the breastbone here, the sternum and manubrium, isn't all that well represented, as well as the kneecaps. Pretty expected. These are very fragile bones with not a lot of dense cortical bone. They tend to not represent that well because they don't preserve that well. Uh, what's rather curious, though, is if you drew an imaginary line down the midline of the Islamic skeleton, you start to notice that almost all the left side is a lot less represented than the right side, which makes sense if you're buried on the right side, the left side is going to be exposed to the surface and any sort of subsurface damage. 
Where we see differences is in the preservation. So the bone might be there for these groups, but that doesn't mean that they're preserved really well, which again speaks to why we use these indices in concert. The Islamic bones on average are just really, really poorly preserved. Um, uh, Islamic bones are on average only 26 to 43 percent preserved versus Christian bones are on average 36 to 55 percent preserved. And we can model this a little further by looking at the number of well-preserved skeletons excavated from the site. So on the x-axis here, we have the proportion of well-preserved skeletons. If you had a site where every skeleton was perfectly well-preserved, you'd be way over to the right by one. And if you were to have a site with zero preservation, oh, all the way to the left. And these are distributions, uh, and the shaded area corresponds to a uh, density, and the shaded line, or the dashed line here is the, the average value. And what we see is that the proportion of Christian skeletons is shifted way towards the right with little overlap here. Uh, ranging between 36 to 53 percent of skeletons versus Islamic only 16 to 28. Uh, in fact, Christian skeletons have a 240 percent increased odds of being well preserved compared to their Islamic counterparts. A pretty stark finding considering they're buried in the exact same sort of geography and, and sediment. So that gets into this, the results. Let's go on to some of these interpretations here. Uh, and I want to discuss this in, as considerations specifically for urbanism uh, in both life and death. And what I'd argue here is that skeletal evidence can help complicate historical narratives. Uh, we have this beautiful tile bench that I've been coming to, and this is, this is done in a very traditional Portuguese azulejo or blue tile uh, depiction that is sort of a mosaic. And this is actually taken from a bench within the, the major citadel or historic area of Santarém, sort of uh, fantastically canonizing the importance of the Christian conquest and, and the arrival of Christianity to thwart off Muslim invaders. Uh, and this is why I, I avoid this term reconquista, because I think a lot of historians have shown throughout the, the 20th century that this, these terms were, this term is very laden and, and somewhat invented in a fantastical manner uh, to help try to Christ, Christianize the sort of history here. Uh, and a retaking that prefix is a bit odd because there weren't necessarily Christian uh, people in the same way occupying the landscape prior to the Muslim occupation. Uh, so it's it's very interesting, and I think what skeletons can do is provide a bottom-up means of reconsidering history, since they embody the accumulated actions, habits, and diets of everyday people. Historical documents undoubtedly give a rich, rich picture of many aspects of daily life, but I think can fail to get at a textured cross-section of a large portion of the medieval laity. Uh, and in terms of life ways here, I would say the Christian data uh, seem to have result seem to suggest a, a worsening of health outcomes after the Christian conquest, not a bettering of it, despite the, the historical narratives. And this is part of an emerging pattern from other data sets as well throughout portions of Spain and Portugal that are employing similar comparative studies. And I think this has to do a bit with urbanism. After the Christian conquest in the 12th century, Santarém became re restructured as an important relig Christian religious pilgrimage center under the Portuguese crown, drawing on numerous mendicant orders and establishing upwards of 15 parishes and numerous convents and monasteries throughout the city in the later medieval period. Uh, this is a somewhat of a dated map, but what we have here is a uh, our site of Lago Candido de Reis, right outside the historical city center. This is that citadel where that bench would be. Uh, and we can just see this sort of dense, the point I'm trying to show here is this dense, almost labyrinthian network here. Uh, and this seems to really increase throughout the Christian later Middle Ages. Um, and I've been interpreting this in, in terms of recent scholarship, such as the bioarchaeology of urbanization, which looks at some of the biocultural consequences of living in cities in the past. Uh, and I think the scholarship has been really helpful for me in terms of understanding the life ways, but it doesn't really get at how urbanization affects whether or not the dead got there in the first place or how. And this gets back to our questions of death ways and taphonomy. And I think it's really crucial to keep in mind in an, a region such as Spain and Portugal during the Middle Ages. Uh, Ruiz Taboada, who works in Toledo in Spain, states, quote, Muslim cemeteries ceased to be a part of Spain's historical landscape centuries ago due to both the purposeful destruction of funerary markers by Catholic monarchs who are anxious to eradicate any funerary remains of non-Christian communities and to urban development. And I think this urban development is what we're seeing, especially here. Um, as a sort of counterpoint, if you were to go to the historic cemetery today in Santarang, you would notice quite how dense and uh, very cement-like it can be in many areas. And, and something that's, I think, quite jarring for those of us in the United States, where you have tombs with multiple placards of occupants of that tomb throughout various time frames. And these are not necessarily related individuals. This is in part because Portugal, like many other portions of Mediterranean Europe, utilize a leasing program that is a usually three to five year window to permit you to skeletonize where you will then be taken out and placed elsewhere to allow the tomb for a new occupant. Issues of horizontal space due to urbanization and the importance of consecrated ground are both at play here. And this is something that's not new. Uh, this is something I think that's been going on for about a millennium. These are illuminated manuscripts, not uh, admittedly from Portugal, but from different books of ours throughout different portions of Central and Northern Europe. 
And what you can see is these uh, wall demarcations uh, here in each of these, probably showing the, the general perimeter of the parish churchyard associated with the church and a funerary procession of an individual being buried in a sort of simple shroud. But if you look closely in each of these cases, you'll see jumbles of bones at the surface depicted. Oftentimes it's a taking out of the previous occupants to put a new individual in, not unlike what I showed earlier in the case of our cemetery here. And nowhere can this be seen better than the case of a Capella dos Ossos or the Chapel of Bones, I think in our case in Evra in southern Portugal. Constructed in the 16th century, Franciscan monks who aggregated, uh, aggregated 5,000 burials uh, for 43 cemeteries in Evra in order to repurpose that valuable land into something else. So again, these issues of horizontal space and repurposing the dead as a form of architectural features. So I would say urbanization goes beyond just life, but also death. Deathways, in terms of deathways, Christian conquest and urbanization also affected and continues to affect the dead and buried. And it seems to disproportionately affect Muslim burials in our observed data. Again, back to our 240% decreased odds of being well-preserved. So what I'm going to try to articulate here is a set of taponomic trajectories. That is, when the living community is presented with a dead body, the preparation of that body is already going to differ along religious or faith lines. In the case of Islam, stripping of the body, ritualized washing and shrouding, and a brief postmortem interval, that is, putting the body into the ground as soon as possible. Versus in Christianity, occasionally stripping and washing, sometimes wrapping the body, but also burying and clothing, with a, a more variable or interval based on social and religious status. Muslim graves are meant to level previous inequalities in life, such as the wealthy, the poor, the aristocrats, uh, are all buried in the same sort of grave structure or tomb-like structure. Versus in Christianity, proximity to the actual altar and church and tomb start to become a huge thing in terms of class. So in terms of bodily interment here, Islamic graves at large Kanidajres are generally narrow and shallow, possibly to facilitate the body in, uh, in, a, in accordance and direction with Mecca, as well as being able to hear the call to prayer and landscaping, uh, whereas Christian burials are, are generally wider and deeper. This then cascades, I think, into what we observe in terms of the body alteration. In the case of Islamic graves, more bioturbation in snails and invertebrate, act invertebrate activity, more erosion from penetrating root systems. In the case of Christian graves, better prone preservation and better whole skeleton preservation. Results at large candida trays suggest that taphonomic filters, I think, are considered best considered in a temporal manner that extends beyond just the post-depositional processes. As cultural and religious funerary customs for preparing the dead body in the grave itself alter the very later contours of taphonomic influences. We can then overlay our taphonomic triad, as coined by our paleontological colleagues, to see the sequence of events in a more protracted manner. And in doing so, I say biocultural stratinomy here, I'm trying to insert cultural here, uh, rather than biostratinomy, as humans do not exclusively occupy the biosphere, but always embedded in a cultural context and, and culturally imbued. So when I think about these results, I can't help but think back to some of my initial readings here at UC Berkeley as an undergraduate and stemming from uh, some of the, and my initial exposure to biocultural approaches. And I'm going to talk about Elisa Sobo here, a biological anthropologist, who asks, uh, what contributes more to the area of a square, the height or the base? And the answer, of course, is a trick question. Uh, and she uses it to try to show how both biology and culture can be very difficult to tease apart when we're thinking about the human body, because no human body is ever devoid of culture. I can't help but think if we can try to do something similar with our archeological understandings of cultural and natural or non-cultural and non-natural and understanding their co-contribution and co-constitution for the taphonomy of the human body as well. I think it becomes very difficult to tease apart what is natural and what is cultural when you start to understand things on a larger temporal scale. Uh, and it's, it's here, I think, where an integrated, uh, Integrated anthropologically informed taphonomy goes beyond distortion and can be operationalized into a worthwhile means of anthropological inquiry. It's here where I think the dialogue between the desires of the living need to be weighed with the eschatological desires of the denizens of the past. A challenge facing many areas of the world today where the dead and our ancestors live just beneath our feet. And thankfully, that deliberation has been happening here for decades and continues to happen. The research presented here today, my role in it, is but a small part of a larger municipally sponsored archaeology team and contract archaeologists that work within and for community members as the city continues to urbanize and subsurface renovations take place. Over the last eight years, I've had the immense pleasure and opportunity to work alongside these archaeologists, municipal staff, and community members, and feel honored to be called many of them dear friends. As I look forward, and I look forward to future and continued collaboration and dialogue for many years to come. And I'm happy to speak more about this. I want to conclude by just a tremendous uh, 
gratitude and acknowledgements, principally here, starting with my dissertation orals committee, Dr. Serena Agarwal, Lori Wilkie, Marine Miller, Kent Lightfoot, and Dr. Seth Holmes, as well as my uh, innumerable co collaborators and colleagues at the Camarón Municipal de Centraim, and additional archaeologists that I've had the pleasure of working with and City Hall staff. Uh, immense thanks as well to my wife and many of the other lab members and uh, friends and mentors who made this research possible, and the undergraduates as well. I, I still very much look fondly on my own uh, exposure to undergraduate research and mentorship through Berkeley, and I think it's one of the strengths of this school, undoubtedly. And so thank you specifically to Ashley Blake, Will Gerardo, Sithalik Martinez-Diaz, and Lily connell Barons for helping make this research possible. Uh, funding uh, agencies as well really helped make sure that this research could be done. And then thankfully, uh, I just want to thank as well the department for, for sponsoring me over these 10 years. It's been a tremendous journey, and I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Anyone more? Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Trent. That was really great to see what you've been doing. Um, given your information about the tombs, you're putting it all together, and your final point about taking bodies out and putting bodies in, yeah, in an in urban setting. Do you think the bodies you dealt with, the bodies that were excavated, were the last bodies of many that were put in these tombs, and therefore are they dated to like the end of each of these phases, or are they a melee mixture? And that urban world of re re jettisoning, yeah. what was operating there? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I think the, what's weird is not to only see these cemeteries as palimpsests, which they are, but then particularly these Christian tombs, which get even more complicated, right? Uh, I think in some cases what we have is probably the the individual that we see most articulated in the is probably the final sequence of that particular burial and the other one to two occupants are probably the previous occupants my hope was to be able to and i was using stall funding as part of the way to try to understand some of these christian tombs more more deeply but with the pandemic i wasn't able to get samples to do the christian burials we we got some of the preliminary radiocarbon datings for the islamic cemeteries throughout the city which has been really helpful and we were able to do one christian one uh which is way back and one of the ones I showed you, the multi-faith one with the Islamic one being bicut, the ossuary dates right to after, the, the, that is the Christian individual dates to right after roughly 80 to 100 years after the Islamic individual. But whether that other Christian individual, we didn't get to sample yet. So that would be the next part, because I want to know more about this sequence, because a lot of the hypotheses are that, oh, these, these are probably relatives. These are familial relatives utilizing the same family structure. I think it's possible, and some people have tried to do some biological ADNA or biodistance data to elucidate that. I haven't seen anything that's conclusive. It seems to be very variable. Some cases, maybe they're familial, but then when you do radiocarbon dating, it's okay, they could be familial, but why do you have a 200-year gap or something like that? So I think there's some variations. I think they're probably structured in a way, but I bet some are much more complicated. And some of these Christian ones tend to be in more... Um, more pit-like structures, maybe coinciding with things like epidemics or plague, things like that, but we just haven't had the datings yet for those. Does that help answer? Yeah. Thank you. I'll try to keep an eye on chat too. So. Yeah. Any questions? Mm -hmm. First off, I don't know. Thanks, Preston. Um, I'm curious about that square at the end. You know, yeah, some of the axes by which these things happen with folk, and you yeah. talked, you know, you showed the, the picture of the Austria. Okay, so you know, excavating in West Africa, you just saw Islamic burials and urns, yeah, right, and trying to understand, oh, okay, so might the axes in one direction or another be pushed by, okay, well, they have facilities for these folk, right, yeah. and their bodies go these, these various ways, and some of those facilities are kind of like. Common facilities versus facilities that are more limited in their scope because when they're smaller, sure, they're the right. communal kind of aspect. Yeah. So, 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 in you know, can you maybe talk a little bit more about how those types of practices down the road affect what you might see in in these communities as you as they're recovered? Um, and then, of course, you said the wonderful thing about you know class, and you know, some folks are very close to the altar. Yeah. That's likely get dug up later, right? right? Because yeah. they're so close to the altar, that's where the money's at, right? Yeah, so, you know, thinking about donors and the university, and like, I don't want to get money, so we're going to be killed. 
right? Um, this may be the same case. You don't yeah. want to get money to, to the church or, or get buried at the church if you know your body's going to get moved, right? Sure. Yeah. But again, where are these axes pushed? Like, yeah. It's interesting. I think in, in the case of later medieval Christendom, there's a, an interesting argument by this scholar, Housemare, who argues, who coins this term topographies of the afterlife. And she's basically saying that Christianity in this period has this very idealistic idea of death leveling, the universal leveler. But then you start to get very specific uh, political economic structure to cemeteries and proximity to altar. And it's typically, like you said, either uh, members of the clergy or, or religious aristocracy or often maybe social elites to be buried within the church walls. And then who gets buried outside of the parishioner cemetery? Uh, there's also this additional layer of debate going on, I think, uh, specifically in about the 13th, 14th century uh, within the papacy of trying to figure out, do are we allowed to take people out or uh, dismember them, in a sense. Uh, and this really comes from, from this uh, particular scholar Brown's work, and she looked at papal bulls coming from Boniface, and who's really trying to say, I don't think you should be taking people apart anymore. And it, beca it became this huge theological discussion. Does God have the power to reconstitute a body that is effectively in different places, in different pieces? And you have a lot of theologians struggling with that. And that starts to cascade into how they treat the body. Do you Are you able to treat the body in a way that has to be, leave it intact in, a, in its own specific burial? Or can we jumble them and not worry about it because we got issues of space pressing here and he's going to be fine in doing it. So you have a lot of this debate going on, I think, in the late 13th, you know, 12th century or so. And whether or not that cascades to particular parishes is a little more debated, I think. Um, I think what's interesting is to see the tremendous variation uh, in Islamic treatment. Uh, there's there's a general consistency that we see in Iberia, at least in, in Portugal. There, there is a sort of north to south variation. Um, but what I've been trying to slowly look at is this in terms of um, sample dispersion. That is really trying to see how what's like the standard deviation for these sorts of graves for Islamic ones versus Christian. And they tend to be quite small, sometimes less than half or Christians to be two to three times and very more variable. And even things like their metrics or dimensions compared to the Islamic ones. And so there seem to be some heavy prescriptions going on, at least in certain regions, but other places that's completely thrown out the window. Uh, you might have commingling. We have some individuals who are buried with tile coverings. Uh, we have some, some with more stone tomb structures. So there was clearly some differences even within the Muslim treatment as well. And that I think is the, some of the interesting aspect. But a lot of those are going to be excavated only in these sort of municipal contexts where it's uh, more of a... Uh, trying to rescue or trying to get anything that would otherwise be damaged. Does, does that help answer? For sure, for sure. Evie? Um, you mentioned that you know, all the different efforts going into putting bodies on their side. Yeah. The yeah. Do you have either qualitatively or number-wise an estimate of like how often that's how often those skulls are yeah. recovered on their side? Yeah, so I think most of the ones here, um, of the 422, and I could double check with my collaborator, most of them seem to be pretty uh, discernible. And this is where that French technique becomes really, really helpful. Because what we end up seeing is many Christian individuals, they're laying on their back in decomposition, the head will often decompose to the right or the left based on the articulation with the atlas. Uh, whereas the Islamic burials, you can have an individual on their right side, but then decompose backwards. So they can look eerily similar to one another. And this is where taking a, a very anatomical approach to particular joints and body starts to help. So one of the things we end up, that I ended up looking at in this case was the femora or femur. Uh, the right femur was often in its sort of socket, but the left one was articulated up, which shows you that during the decomposition process, that femur left its socket and then the individual fell. And so you have one femur that looks like it's in prone or um, supine position and one that looks like it's in decubitus or right position. And so even though the, the, the final thing might look very similar between the Christian and Islamic, you can start to look at particular bones and elements. Um, the patellae as well, unfortunately they didn't preserve as well, but they're probably some of the most informative bones in terms of burials on decomposition, uh, in part because if the individual is buried in open space, that is a, so, some sort of coffin or space around them, what will happen is the 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 hip joint will decompose, the legs will go out, and the patellae will go laterally or outwards. If they're still there in the position, oftentimes that means they were buried in dirt or some sort of soil that helped keep them there as the soft tissue slowly went away. So 
In terms of the quantitative, I'd have to go look, but most of them, we have pretty good evidence that they were. Um, and, but there's other parts of the world where it's not so much. Um, and, and in many portions of North Africa, the Near East with Muslim burials, they advocated for burying in a supine position and just maybe trying to have the, the head or, or as, as Professor Sinceri was saying in, in, in urns, tomb structures, there's tremendous variation. Here we have it a little bit more easy to discern, um, but I've seen other parts, portions of Spain where it's more tricky, where they say, I can't say which funerary group these, these individuals belong to because we have such a complex thing of decomposition or tomb structure, et cetera. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah. I'm fascinated. Okay. I know nothing about her before this. Um, I was intrigued by the photograph of um, all of the bones that have been reassembled very artistically, you know, in public some graphs. Uh, yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about that practice and mm -hmm. was it combined mm -hmm. with certain historical theory and uh, particular region? Is it that you pretty much anyone that it gets transferred to South America? I've seen it. Yeah, uh, so this, this sort of repurposing of burials into, particularly I would say into architectural features, uh, is something you see oftentimes with very particular orders. Um, the Franciscans, Cistercians, Capuchins, you see this happening through different orders at different periods of time. Uh, it's not just going to be in Iberia. There's a, quite a few. This one is the most proximate, I would say, in terms of the scope of how much they became incorporated in the architecture. There's quite a few in Spain. Uh, we went to one in Rome, the, the Capuchin Crypt, a lot less number of individuals, but repurposing bones in terms of into the architecture. The biggest one I've been to is in Kutnahora in uh, the Czech Republic, which has 20,000 plus individuals repurposed. And if you go there, it's a very, very small chapel or church with a very small churchyard and every square inch of that churchyard are just tombs or burial structures, burial plots. So they've just been utilizing the, the the particular monks there have been reutilizing those bones for many, many years and incorporating them into the architecture. So I think it was part of a later sort of Christian movement, um, but it's oftentimes done by, by specific orders at a different periods of time and sometimes in, in tandem with what's the available space and can we repurpose this in any sort of way. In the case of Evra, I think that's partially what's going on is you have Franciscan monks who are doing it as this sort of confrontation with death that instead of putting it off to the side, let's confront it, let's acknowledge that it's a part of our, our existence and that it's coming for us. But let's also repurpose 46 different areas that were previously cemeteries into different kinds of land. So I think I think it varies a bit. Did they try to justify in some way that uh, this is going to be pleasing to really because... Yeah, I think that, or just um, trying to, in, in the case of some of the Franciscans, it's, it's, I think it's really to put death in front of you. Uh, and you see this also with the Order of Cluny. Uh, the Order of Cluny and Cluny performs in the 13th century really try to foreground that death is not something we should ignore, but confront and it should be omnipresent. It should be there. It sh you should be thinking about it. And so... It gets incorporated with architecture in that sort of way. Um, but I think, again, it varies tremendously on where those orders seem to have influence, uh, the available material, if they're permitted to do so. In the case of Putin Ahura in the Czech Republic, it doesn't seem like that was particularly sanctioned. I don't think most of the people who got buried there as Christians wanted to be dug up by another Christian in the name of Christianity. So you have some, some tensions there. Um, but I think this is where things can get really complicated, but interesting as well. And so there's there's some good works that are slowly starting to do a more Europe- uh, at least the ones I've seen for my work, a, a Europe kind of wide approach to bone chapels and how systemic they are, uh, but usually see them as bone chapels in that case. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I was trying to see any questions. Well, wishes. Okay. Um, so what a dear friend of mine, Oren, who also works on um, in, in, in Spain in this case, asks, um, what sort of next steps would you like to see this research taken? Is enough evidence for comparing graves of other incorporated communities, either Jews, Romani, or even lepers? Might this research help understand the life ways or death ways of converts, uh, willing or forced in the context of religiously dynamic Iberian world? Uh, it's a great question from Oren, who works in a slightly later period than me on, and, and in part on conversion. Uh, yes, you'll notice that this is absolutely uh, not covering, say, the, the major other sort of tripartite axis of religious faith communities of, of Jewish communities. Uh, and this is something that Ruiz Taboada, who is working in Toledo, has also acknowledged as well, that the, the Jewish funerary customs seem to be a bit more difficult to pin down uh, in terms of Muslim burial customs in this period, which are 
define it in sort of stark opposition to Christian customs. Uh, Ruiz Tabuada and a lot of other scholars working in Spain have a lot more research. What ends up happening, I think, a lot of times in, in Portugal is that you have um, just not as much of a proliferation of the of the sort of scholarly literature that comes out outside of gray literature, reports from municipal excavations, but also um, trying to understand what are the material dimensions of, of Jewish funerary treatment has been a bit trickier in some cases. So uh, it's something I'd like to look at more. It's something I think there's probably a, a lot of interesting examples in the case of um, in the case of, of, of medieval Portugal. I think the second question about converts, or can you try to even see that archaeologically? This is something that I think Mark and I have talked about here and there about. Uh, you know, is there ways in which we can see that? And some people have tried to, to do some of this in southern Spain by looking at activity. That is um, specifically looking at the ways in which the, the lower joints tend to wear um, as a result of the call to prayer, which is a very repeated action that you're doing usually five times a day over the course of 40 years. That's going to leave potentially osteological markers. And so can you see potential communities getting um, Islamicized effectively as a result of this? Um, in terms of other ones, I think diet would be my most interesting way to look at that. Uh, and I couldn't, I think isotopes would be interesting, but as many different lines of evidence, ceramics, palatological remains, faunal remains would, would also help show this. Um, so I think it's, it's, it'd be an interesting possibility to, to see. And I think it would take a lot of different sources, not just bones to help get a richer picture of that. Are there any other questions on the chat? Not that I see. Uh, Anna asks, how many proportion, how many slash proportion of the graves did you notice have overlapping burials? It's a great question. I think, Anna, it was pretty small. I think 8%. It doesn't happen. It didn't happen uh, a large amount to where we had multiple, uh, an Islamic burial bisected by a later Christian one. Um, but I think it was around maybe 10 or so cases or maybe a couple more, but it wasn't super, super prevalent. I, I, I would posit, I, I'm not saying my collaborators would, but I would posit that it seems to be very happenstance and accidental. I don't think, and I mentioned Ruiz de Tabuada's quote that in Spain that you have Catholic monarchs anxiously trying to eradicate Islamic cemeteries. I think at least in the case of Sandraim, I don't think that's the case. I think a lot of these were accidental. What's really interesting about the one image I showed you again is it seems that they not only put a Christian individual in, but cached or kept the bones from the lower extremities of the Islamic individual. I don't think it was an intentional sort of... Um, damage, I think it just starts to become an issue of space. What we do see, undoubtedly, in the later Christian Middle Ages is after the Christian conquest, they, anywhere there was a mosque, they tend to convert that into a church. And so that means that if you have any burials associated with that mosque as an extramural mosque, uh, those are probably going to be bisected by later Christian ones. So I think it's part of this sort of dynamic of different religious communities ap approaching buildings, places of worship, and uh, deathscapes in, a, in different manners. Uh, did you see similar presentation in infant or adolescent burials? Great question. Uh, that's for my mom, so she's digging in. Uh, she uh, she found the soft spot. So uh, we don't. What's weird is we don't have a lot of subadults at this site. Um, and part of that might be uh, what we think is what tends to happen in, in a lot of Muslim cemeteries is that they actually spatially segregate children and, and adults to where they're not integrated to the same cemetery. So we do have, I have a friend and a colleague who specialize in the analysis of the subadults from these, from these various sites in the city, um, but just a very, uh, an overall dearth of representation. And we think it's probably because they were part of the cemetery, either in another area that wasn't excavated, uh, I think the cemetery, and I think my collaborators obviously think it was probably much larger. These burials probably went way out this way in every direction, but only the zone that was uh, for impact was excavated. So 622, it's probably a lot, lot larger, um, but it was only the area that was going to be directly impacted, which was excavated. And so it's possible the subadults for maybe both communities would have been found in some sort of other area. Um, but I think that's probably why we don't see a, a huge proliferation of the subadult remains in this case. Additionally, going back to taphonomy, there's issues of preservation. Subadult bones, we think, generally don't preserve as well. They don't have as much of the um, uh, they don't have as much of the cortical bone or some other portions of bone that seem to help them survive as much, particularly in an environment like this, which is surprisingly volatile. These are all alkaline soils. These should theoretically preserve quite well. Uh, they were all capped under cement. Should preserve quite well. We have 622 burials. And over 400 Islamic burials, and roughly 40 of them are well preserved by our well preserved skeleton metric. So, some things I think go, or a number of things I think are going on in this case. And so, it could be that subadults were present, but just maybe weren't excavated or, or highly damaged or fragmentary over the course of millennia. 
Well, thank you. I guess we'll end on mom's question. Yeah. <laughs> thank you.